Hi, I'm Lynn Bowie from Ali Komatz Education and Wits University. And I'm going to be presenting today on behalf of myself and my colleague Craig Panara, also from Wits University. And what we want to share with you today is some insights that we've got from looking at learner performance, and these are grade seven and eight learners, on the whole number items in a diagnostic baseline test that we developed and administered. Um, and the main question we're looking at in looking at their performance is trying to discern their readiness, their preparedness for algebra. A big challenge that faces grade eight teachers is that they need to try and figure out what kind of maths um, knowledge and skills their learners come to them with. Um, and this is quite difficult because they're often dealing with learners coming from a whole lot of different primary schools with very different um, levels of background. And then in addition to this, uh, what we see in South Africa is that um, on entering high school, our learners are often far behind where we expect them to be. So if we look at this piece of research by Spall and Kotze, we can definitely see that le their prediction was that low learners in um, lower quintile schools, by the time you enter high school, that kind of gap between them and learners in quintile five schools um, has reached about three to four years. In other words, um, your learners from the lower quintile schools are likely to be three to four years behind their expected grade level at the time they enter high school. And this poses for us an enormous challenge. Of course, in addition to that, you had in 2020, the COVID pandemic, which only exacerbated any inequalities that existed in the system. And so in all likelihood has even widened this performance gap. So for Craig and I, there's been a, a, a sort of ongoing interest and concern around improving the teaching of le and learning of maths, particularly in grades eight and nine. We'd like to see more learners choosing FET maths and being able to succeed at it, and that requires a strong preparation. And of course, if we want learners to be strong and prepared, we need teachers who feel competent and confident to teach maths for understanding in grade eight and nine. And so as part of our commitment to these ideas um, and wanting to achieve these, we started to, 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 to really ask some questions about what maths do learners bring with them to high school and to what extent are they actually prepared for algebra when they enter high school? Um, and so for this, we start, we developed a test instrument to assess learners' maths skills and knowledge at the end of grade seven, beginning of grade eight. Um, and we wanted this um, test to be able to um, do two things for us. Firstly, we wanted to, it to give us some kind of baseline measure of what learners are entering high school with, um, and that we could possibly then repeat it, this test at a later stage to see whether we were actually making a difference in terms of the kind of knowledge and skills learners had. So a baseline measure was one goal for us. And the other is we wanted to be able to use this test to diagnose learners' errors and misconceptions. And so that's why we've called this test uh, the DEBA test because it's a diagnostic baseline test. So it encompasses both. Um, and we piloted um, the items in 2020 and then repeated and um, tested in 2021. And what we're going to be talking about today are some of the results from that um, initial pilot testing. In a sense, this um, Research was triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic um, because it, you know, it became a real issue of urgency for us to try and understand um, what kind of learners we would be getting into high school at the start of 2021, given everything that happened in 2020. But it certainly isn't limited to a, a response to COVID-19. Um, as indicated earlier, we, we've known for a long time now that there are real issues um, in terms of backlogs for learners entering high school. 
Um, and of course, although what we're limiting ourselves to here at this point is just uh, talking to you a little bit about the testing and what it brought forth for us. But of course, the, the testing is only the beginning um, of the process. Uh, what's really important is what we do with the information we get from the testing. Um, and that um, we can talk about it at another stage is a sort of whole separate thing of, okay, right, once we know all this, what do we actually do with it? What kind of programs, interventions, et cetera, can we put in place in schools um, in order to achieve um, the things that we were talking about, right? That learners being able to succeed in grade eight and nine maths in a way that enables them to, to actually choose maths um, for matric. So emerging out of this then um, are the clear research questions that we had and the research questions specific to this paper, there were broader research questions that we were looking at in the design and implementation of the test. So in this report, we particularly focus on the questions, how did the grade seven and eight learners perform on the whole number items in the DEBA test? And what implications does this performance have in terms of their readiness for algebra? So before we dive into the, um, the uh, actual results or anything, let's talk about preparedness, readiness for algebra and the role that whole numbers might have within that. So there is no doubt that work with whole numbers is preparation for algebra and could be and should be preparation for algebra. But what is it within the whole work with whole number that is important for algebra? Well, we see two core themes emerging from the literature and our experience. The first of these is fluency, the importance of being fluent with the basic operations and with whole number. And the second is um, an early preparation around algebraic thinking within the context of whole number. So I'm going to explain each of these in greater depth. To start with the notion of fluency and the importance of fluency, I think an example from practice um, exemplifies it best, and then I'll, I'll kind of put in place around that the research um, that backs this up. So, for example, if you imagine you're a, a, a grade eight teacher trying to teach the distributive law and you're looking at um, explaining to your learners how to multiply 3x by x plus 8, what we often see when we're busy working with this um, and what we've seen many times in practice is that what the learner is going to is going to end up spending quite a bit of time on is the calculation of three multiplied by eight, because they don't have that fluency to know that three multiplied by eight is 24. And so what we see them doing is drawing all those little stripes, eight stripes, three times, and then they kind of count all those stripes to work out what the answer is. And by the time they've kind of spent all their effort doing that, um, there's a real question uh, as to whether there's any space for them to even try and absorb the actual algebra and the background information that they need to be, not background information, the new information that they need to be grasping. So there's the kind of core idea, the illustration of why we believe fluency with basic whole number facts is important from practice we've just seen. If learners are so absorbed in actually having to do the calculations in very painful um, extended ways, um, they're not going to be able um, to really pay attention. The research literature backs this up. Um, very strongly. Um, so, for example, Pakutilo and Luna um, state computational fluency is a strong predictor of students' algebra achievement and retention. So, there's no question in that regard. Um, one of the things that one of the, the sort of theories that really helps um, explain why this might be so is the theory of cogn cognitive load. 
Uh, and cognitive load um, theory is based on the premise that there are limits to how much new information a learner can process at a time, as well as limits to how much stored information can be processed at a time. Um, and they, they make distinctions between various kinds of cognitive load, but of particular interest in the study is intrinsic co cognitive load, because that's the load that's inherent in the complexity of the content to be learned, and it's related to the number of interacting elements in the task and the prior knowledge of the learner. Um, and what uh, Sweller um, and co have said, and they're kind of some of the key uh, researchers in this field of cognitive load, what they've indicated is that um, many algebra tasks, in fact, most algebra tasks have high interactivity, a large number of interacting parts that you have to consider. And so they have high intrinsic load. And this means that there is essentially a lot of pieces of information that a learner has to process while working on an algebra task. And, and cognitive load theory tells us there's only a limited number of things that a learner can kind of basically hold in their head at a time. One way that we can reduce the number of pieces, the high interactivity in an algebra task is to automate or to make completely fluent some of the parts. And there, if we can automate um, the learner's ability to do the calculations with number so that they just know, for example, if we're looking at that previous example we had, they just know that eight times three is 24. They're completely fluent with that fact. Then that, what could have been a large part of the load is no longer part of the load. And so they have um, the ability to focus uh, more specifically on the algebra that they're working with. So it, it, both from our, our experience in practice and from the research and theory, there is a strong indicator that fluency with basic calculations and um, with whole number really will free up um, the, the reduce the load um, for uh, learning algebra. And to be clear here, we don't mean that we need, you know, that, that we're not of the school, oh, you know, ban calculators for everything. I'm perfectly happy that if a learner needs to do, you know, 5,921 multiplied by 3,278, that they can use a calculator to do that. The kind of fluency we're talking about is generally with quite basic, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, performance of, of the, the basic operations and things, for example, like knowing immediately what the square root of 36 is equal to. So it's that kind of task we're talking about. The other area where we think that there is an important um, aspect that we need to consider is the whole aspect of early algebra. Um, so that's the other kind of link to it. So to consider what are the aspects, what is early algebra and what are we talking about here is important. A number of researchers um, who have been looking at the importance of early algebra. Um, and really what they're arguing for is that it's really important to build learners' understanding of algebra through the early introduction of algebraic thinking. Now, that doesn't mean that we're talking about the early introduction of, you know, variables and, um, you know, a sort of any level of formal algebra. It's about building in the algebraic thinking into earlier years, and often this is done um, mostly this will be done through um, the way one looks at whole number. So if we have a look at some of the, the um, aspects that people have talked about um, in the research literature um, around what might be included in early algebra um, to get an idea of, of the field we're talking about here. One key aspect is, is really moving away from seeing the equals to sign as give me the answer to the sum and seeing it in its true notion of representing equality. 
um, between two, you know, the, 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 the sides of the equation. So here, for example, seeing that what you're being asked to do here is not to say what is 83 plus 5, but being seeing that you want to have that left-hand side equal to the right-hand side. So experiences um, of early experiences of um, getting a proper understanding of the equals to sign is an important aspect of early algebra. The other thing that one wants to start to uh, get, get learners working with and thinking about um, is the idea of generalizations, making generalizations, noticing how things behave and trying to kind of formulate that into a, a kind of generalized um, statement. So, you know, on a very simple level, sort of being able to see that Oh, if I take one and I multiply it by any number, it'll just be equal to that number. Um, and so kind of being able to make those statements rather than each time just being one times three is three, one times five is five. In addition, being able to make that general statement, a one times any number is itself. In a similar vein, kind of looking at stuff, looking at, 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 at um, patterns of how um, various operations behave. So for example, here, yeah, noticing and making explicit and talking about the um, distributive law uh, with multiplication over addition and being able to see that this is how this works. These are all strong precursors for algebraic thinking, this kind of a generalization and noticing the patterns um, of behavior of um, the various uh, uh, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, the operations. The other aspect that is important and, um, and emerge, can emerge um, early um, is the idea of, oh dear, don't know why that's gone backwards. Let's just uh, go back to where I was there. Um, th is the um, work on functional thinking. So being able to, for example, look at kind of patterns and see how patterns emerge, or like in this kind of sort of flow diagram, function machine type idea, seeing um, the relationship between an input and an output um, and kind of working with, um, you know, here's a simple one of just actually working with the output, but in some cases one can look at the input and the output and try to establish what rule um, created the output from the input. Those kind of things are one is able to work at long before one introduces any level of formal algebra, but certainly are great precursors to proper functional thinking within algebra. So given these kind of ideas emerging from the research, for our test, we had some very key um, areas in the preparation for algebraic thinking that we felt important to, to test in the context of whole number. And these were the following three areas. The first one, understanding of the equal to sign and mathematical equality. Um, and that, like I've sort of shown before, the idea of the equal to sign is not simply a do something, it's, it's representing um, mathematical equality. The second is that idea of generalized arithmetic and the behavior of operations. And so there we would include a question like this, um, a generalization that multiplying by zero will always give you zero. And then the third was the functional thinking idea. Um, and here, a lot of that was through pattern. Um, so some just looking at what might go in the pattern, but then also trying to establish the rule of a pattern or to express the uh, kind of relationship between input and output. So if we take that all together now to summarize what we had been thinking about as what within whole number work might be seen as important for algebra. The first large area was a, a quite a basic idea of fluency that uh, you need a fluency with some core number facts 
And then you also need these three aspects of preparation for algebraic thinking, the um, understanding of the equal sign, behavioral operations, and some functional thinking. So those were our four broad areas. The test itself was much broader than simply looking at um, a, a, a whole number. It included um, whole number, it included some fractions, decimals and percentages. It included patterns, which we've also looked at here in relation to whole number and function ideas. Um, but it also included some introductory algebra um, in a sort of you know, reasonably formal sense uh, with um, you know, uh, having to solve an equation, et cetera. Uh, and then it included some measurement and some geometry. But uh, what we're focusing on in this presentation is simply the work on whole number with some of the work on pattern um, and functions that related to whole number. So in this presentation, these are the items that we are looking at. And these are in relation to those four areas of preparation for algebra that we have talked about from the literature. So there were 15 items that dealt purely with fluency with whole number, three that related to understanding of the equal to sign, eight looking at behavior of operations and generalized arithmetic, and then three relating to functional thinking. The data that we collected, um, this was for the pilot, and it was, we collected it in, um, towards the end of the year in 2020. We did uh, it in 15 schools in Gauteng. All of these schools were in township areas. Um, and we included 483 grade seven learners, because uh, basically we're talking about um, at the end of the year. So we were, we um, looked at kind of where grade seven learners were at the end of the year would give us a good sense of um, what kind of knowledge they might come to high school with. But we also included 188 grade eight learners uh, because the, there was partly the, the, the COVID pandemic had kind of said to us that I th we thought that a lot of the grade eight learners would not have had um, would not have made much progress during 2020. And we wanted that to be part of this. Um, we report here on the grade seven and eight learners all together because that actually gave us um, a very clear picture of, well, a nice picture of what was going on. Uh, Learn to give an hour to write the test. Um, the test was all multiple choice. Uh, they then filled in uh, their answers on answer sheets that looked like this. Um, so they sort of bubbled in their answers on the answer sheets. These were then scanned in by our, and marked by our, our learner management system. Um, and then a spreadsheet of data was produced. Um, and the spreadsheet of data enabled us to look at each item individually, as well as groups of items. But with each item individually, we could look at the um, percentage of learners that got the item correct, but also important for the diagnosis point, from the diagnosis point of view, we could look at the, the percentage of learners who chose each of the distractors. So to give an idea of the performance in each of those categories of um, whole number as preparation for algebra, um, within the fluency with whole numbers, uh, the mean was 41%. Understanding of the equal to sign, 38%. Uh, behavior of operations and generalized arithmetic, 34%. And functional thinking, 46%. What is more interesting perhaps than just these um, broad numbers is to look at particular examples um, from within um, the test to see the performance on those and the kind of things that those could tell us about. Uh, the examples I'm going to show you, because we want to protect the integrity of the test, we're not giving you the exact examples that were on the test, but examples that basically look very much alike so just slightly different numbers or whatever and um, so yeah you, you get a pretty good idea of what was going on in the test without being without seeing the actual items themselves so if we have a look at some of the questions which were in the kind of area of really looking at basic fluency with whole numbers um 
look, we saw that the average in this section was 41%. And um, so clearly there is an issue with fluency and the kind of things we were seeing did show um, a relatively poor number set. So for example, 25% um, of the learners um, thought you calculated a square root by simply dividing by two, and almost half of them uh, chosen odd number when they were asked to select uh, a number that had two as one of its factors. So they're a clear kind of poor number sense. And then if we actually have a look at how things worked with calculations, what we see is that um, a tendency to work kind of digit wise. So with um, some of, you know, doing the, the sum of 39,998 and five, um, the learners simply said, uh, about 19% um, of the learners simply said A plus five is 13 and sort of put that on the end, totally ignoring the place value. Um, and then in a question like the one below where they were really like having to look at what's the relationship between addition and subtraction and kind of understand what they're doing when they're doing um, the calculation, um, only 34% of them managed to get it correct. And the others um, simply did stuff like 25% of them uh, chose the option, which essentially is, um, you know, the one and the five, um, just getting that by eight and one is nine, two and five is seven. So they're do doing something in that kind of vein, or um, where they chose the, the answer is nine and five, which kind of is possibly from saying, well, um, you know, seven minus two is five, and then, well, then you, so you're kind of working the one way for that, and then 18 minus nine gives you nine. So um, working the other way. So, so a little bit of a sort of, you know, focusing on one little bit at a time rather than understanding uh, the picture as a whole. Uh, so yeah, uh, these sort of indicates a lack of fluency with, with kind of the core um, calculations and the way one might do those calculations and understand those. Um, operations. Then there was a question that, that dealt with exponents, um, and but this is not, you know, no complicated exponents, just the cubes and the squares, which we would expect grade sevens and eights to be able to do quite comfortably. Um, grade sevens would not have uh, had any exposure to the um, exponent laws. Um, now, only 28% of the learners managed to correctly work out that the answer was 36. So, you know, three cubed, 27, three squared, nine, add them together, you get your 36. The vast, the, the sort of bulk chose some form that was an exponent form. So three to the five or six to the five. And that is interesting um, because, yeah, the, the, Although one might have anticipated that with the grade eights being a bit kind of confused with some of the exponent laws they would have been exposed to um, with the grade sevens. Um, yeah, it's clear that kind of there, there was some tendency towards that too. Um, and 35% of those grade sevens chose six to the power of five as the answer. So sort of doing, okay, three plus three is six. And then we add the exponents, three plus two is five. So again, kind of a sort of real detachment from the, the, the meaning of um, the exponent idea, but also uh, three cubed and three squared would be exponents. And we, were, I would certainly expect my learners to, to know instantly that three squared is nine, three cubed is 27, for that to be an obvious answer. The other point that's slightly, in, the one, this is one place in which there was a difference between our, our grade eights and sevens in terms of how they answered and, and, and that sort of was a little bit interesting in that, um, the grade sevens actually outperformed the grade eights on this one. Um, so the um, only 23% of the grade eights managed to get this correct. So clearly uh, some interference of having learned um, some of the exponent rules. Uh, it suggests potentially that. Okay, if we move on to the next um, section. Uh, so, that was the sort of fluency. And now we're looking at kind of the early algebra stuff. 
um, and that had our three sections. And the first is the understanding of the equal to sign. And here we see a very strong indication that a large proportion of the learners are still very much um, in, the, in the habit of the kind of equals means do something. So 40% um, uh, gave that in, in both cases, roughly 40% gave the answer of nine. So seven plus two equals nine. Um, the idea that your equals to sign just tells you to do the calculation. Um, what's interesting here uh, is that 46% could get the correct um, solution at the top, uh, only 32% to the next one. Um, and it seems like somehow the, the, the change to subtraction um, caused more problems, uh, which is consistent with uh, kind of previous research we've done um, that shows that um, that kind of work, yeah, the addition is always easier than the negatives subtractions. In our next section in the early algebra, there were quite a number of questions um, that looked at the behavior of operations for generalized arithmetic, and this was one of the, the poorer sections um, in terms of, of, of performance. So the kind of things that we were seeing here, um, like very low performance on things like um, this first one, which asks one to, which asks learners to have a look at and understand um, how multiplication works and some of the properties of multiplication like the distributive law, the associative law, etc. with it. Um, and only 19% of the learners could get that correct. And then, um, you know, more surprisingly, um, because I would have thought this was a much simpler question, um, only 27% could correctly answer um, that so a number divided by one will just be equal to the number itself. So this section for me was a particular concern because these are, these are you know, there is a very um, absolute kind of clear, yeah, parallel into algebra here. Um, and if learners are not able to see some of these, um, the generalized arithmetical behavior of operations in this context of whole number, they're really going to struggle when it comes to algebra. The final section of early algebra, functional thinking, this was actually generally better performed, um, but the questions there, you know, had sort of a reasonably um, a sort of simple kind of pattern or uh, determining um, the kind of relationship between input and output. Um, so yeah, better performance, although below what we would want it to be. So 50% um, could identify the missing number in this pattern of doubling, for example. So what does um, all of this suggest to us and, and what can we draw out as implication, um, some of the implications for teaching and learning? So one of the key things we saw is that, that there, there are backlogs and there certainly are quite a lot of um, uh, things within the whole number that are going to impact um, grade eight's learning of algebra. So we are then going to have to make a plan to allocate some time within grade eight to addressing these issues. And we would suggest that those, um, those kind of backlogs can be, should be very closely uh, tied and connected to what learners are doing in grade eight, so that they, there is a coherence between how they start to understand some of what they have been partially exposed to at primary school and what they're going to be needing it for in high school. So there's some work to be done there for all of us in terms of, of thinking about how we take some of the, the, the work in, in um, with whole number and really kind of infuse it into the grade eight uh, curriculum in a way that makes sense um, for learners and gives them that foundation they need for algebra. We need to make sure that then this kind of content that we include is actually assessed both formally and informally. We need to pay um, attention to, to how learners are answering questions and um, pushing them to really think 
about what they're doing. And many of the questions, there seemed almost like a knee-jerk kind of answer, like what numbers kind of seem to fit roughly with what I've, I've seen, you know? So uh, instead of actually saying, well, let me try and understand and give meaning to the symbols, the processes within the question, it was like, oh, let me, let me kind of pick an answer that somehow has numbers that link to what I've seen. In the question, so that 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 push for meaning, that push for actually, you know, the stuff is meant to make sense, and you need to spend a little time with a question to make it make sense. We need to work further on that with learners. We definitely still need um, at high school level, um, but before too. But at high school level, it is clear we're going to need to do some work with fluency with number. So those kind of mental maths and starter activities that promote fluency um, need to be a vital part of what we do. Uh, we cannot assume that primary school has taken care of the fluency um, that learners need. Um, and so uh, uh, you, this is something that is relatively easy to, to, to work on, but it does need time and dedication and a carefully kind of structured plan to make sure that learners are regularly rehearsing, getting on top of their times tables, for example, um, and able to add and subtract kind of fluently and, and, and quickly in their head. Again, as I said previously, it's not to say we want them to be able to do long, complicated calculations. Um, they can use a calculator at high school, but the core fluencies need to be in place. And then there is a, a clear sort of sense of both within primary and going into high school, we need to, to, to work with number in ways that promote generalization. So, and this probably has quite a, a sort of strong message back into primary schools that we do need to, that we do need our primary teachers to be keeping an eye on where things are going. And so it's not enough just to teach kind of, um, teach in a way that doesn't promote this kind of generalization and seeing beyond just the immediate calculation that you are doing, but finding ways to express generalization to notice the behavior of operations to see how things are working and to start to make those kind of more generally formulated rules and um, does not have to be formulated or and certainly probably shouldn't at primary school in terms of any level of formal algebra but there is a lot that can be played with in terms of um seeing equivalence between different um you know, uh, uh, ways of doing a, you know, the, the, as we saw in the kind of examples, a, a multiplication expressed uh, with the distributive law and playing with some of those kind of things. There's definitely a lot of work that can be done at primary school that starts to open learners' um, ideas to this. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for your time um, and we look forward to engaging with you around um, any questions you might have on this, but also um, what we're particularly excited to do is to start um, thinking about and talking about well, the kind of so what from here. What can we do? What do we need to do, um, both in primary and in the beginning of high school, to ensure our learners really are ready for algebra and able to tackle it in a meaningful way?